Welcome to Alex Flight Deck, podcast dedicated to Montreal Alouettes football, presented by Sport Buff. I'm your host, Tim Capper, along with Cliffy D. Hey, how are you, buddy? Hey, now. See, so you survived the uh, the chilly, chilly game that we had, but it, it heated up, man, I tell you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was fire, as the kids say. <laughs> and did we not look amazing in our, our Delta logo jackets? <laughs> and we made it on TV. <laughs> we did. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I'll say it. we were the TSN turning points. Uh, no, I, I, no. I the, the funny the reaction and comments from people on social media was pretty funny because anybody who didn't see the game it was about a, a minute fifty left in the fourth quarter, and the, the camera panned up, and there we were. There we were. It wasn't as clear as when I was on TV two years ago, but right. But yeah. Still. Well, and I think I think somebody said on social that they they, they stood out. <laughs> yeah, but you know what was nice? I did see a few other people wearing that uh, same jacket. But uh, yeah, you know, I tell you what, folks. I mean, perfect for cold weather games like this. I mean, not that it's not that you know was it single digits is cold weather, but uh, no, I mean it was. I, I was very comfortable in it. So you know, kudos to Starter for making excellent retro jackets that look and feel amazing. Yep. For sure, for sure. So I don't, I don't know when, we're, when we'll get a chance to have another one of those again. But anyways, <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, it's everything's leading up to to what is merely a, a thanks a Thanksgiving, a Halloween Eve day uh, day a day game night game, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> it's a night game. It's- I really wish it were an earlier game, but anyways, that's that's the last two. So, yeah. Um, hey, we, Tim. Yeah? I got some breaking news for you. Do you? Yes. The Montreal Alouettes are currently in first place in the CFL East. Wow. I know. I'm... I'm stunned. I'm, ex- I'm shocked. <laughs> I, I mean, this is this is huge. I mean, if if people didn't know, now you know. That's right. If you didn't happen to see my tweet, now you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. It, it's nice to. I mean, yes, it's just because of points and stuff like that. But still, I'm. Hey, I'm, I'm not going to complain. I mean. Since uh, you know the first time this late in the season since uh, week seventeen of twenty fourteen, I'll take it. Exactly. I, I mean, this is incredible. I mean, it, uh, to see what this team has been able to put together so far. I mean, a, an absolutely dominant win over the Toronto Argonauts, who were in first place. Yeah. I mean, they say to be the man, you have to beat the man. This past Friday, the Argos were the men. And now the Alouettes are the men. Yeah, they did. They did what they had to do. They walked. They defended the nest. They came in ready to go. They had a game plan. They executed it. I'd say to perfection because I mean, they, in all facets of the game, Montreal, they did the thing. They did what they were supposed to do, and they came away with a big W. And now sit in first place. I know. And and you can miss me with this whole well they're actually tied with the Argos. Yes, record wise they are tied with the Argos, but let's not forget if the, well, the f- yeah, if the, if the if the season were to start the players were to start today, the Owls would have a bye. Exactly. And that's because of point differential. The Alouettes scored more points than the Argos in their two games, hence they win the season series and now they sit in first place. I was happy. That. I was happy to see. Then it's been the first time in a while that the Alouettes have have had a meaningful game for first place and have been able to actually come through and win the game. Because mm-hmm. you know, over the past couple, you know, past couple of seasons, it's more than a past couple. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the Alouettes really did not have a good reputation of being able to win those big games, especially when it came to a first potential first place matchup or or moving into first place. And that's exactly what the Owls did this time around. They sure did. And as I said, it was done without, you know, their their superstar quarterback for Adams Jr. I mean, we got another superstar quarterback now in Matthew Schultz and 
for everybody that was doubting Matthew Schultz saying, okay, well, okay, yeah, he won, but he, his game, but he beat the Red Blacks. I'm like, well, now he beat the Argos. So, I mean, are you not entertained? Are, you know, this is what I have to ask. Like, I mean, he did what he had to do. I mean, and he looked good. He, he looked really good. I mean, he's not the same flashy quarterback as Vernon Adams is, and that's fine. He's his own version. Like, he is his own quarterback. And quite frankly, I, I was very, I've been very impressed with how he's done. Like, he has lived up to the hype as far as I'm concerned. And if everybody else now is just finally getting on board, great. Welcome aboard because we've been on the Matthew Shields train for a good while now. I mean, we love Vernon Adams. Like, he is definitely our guy. But we got a lot of love for Maddie as well. I mean, we've we've seen his progressions. We've seen him struggle. We've seen him bide his time on on the Salouettes roster for the past couple of years. He's now finally getting his chance, and he's making the most of it. And he is doing a, a fantastic job, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so far so good. I mean, it was not you know it wasn't as 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 flashy it was versus Ottawa the previous week, but we also had Stan uh, William Stanbeck back. And this is what we expect from William Stanbeck. We didn't we didn't expect him to go off for two bills, though. Holy crap! You know, Man, and same exact same exact yardage as back as the game back in 2019. So exactly like tying a career best. I mean, 203 yards is just phenomenal. I mean, and the only difference was he didn't score a hat trick of touchdowns like he did that first uh, time he notched 200 plus yards, but still he did manage a touchdown this past Friday and man you, you couldn't catch this guy like he turns on the jets and he is gone yeah and it's something that that obviously you know with them winning and now where the place that they're in they need to keep it up because you know the uh you know cfl stats guru steve daniel uh, told me last night and it's already been released by the cfl all three teams but well sorry uh, so the Owls, Argos, and Rough Riders can all clinch a playoff berth this weekend. Mm-hmm. All three. So, you know, it, it just comes down to winning. And we end obviously being in first place. We want to stay in first place. So it's going to be a tough game. But we're going to we'll be talking about that more. And also, you know, a uh, to do that, we have uh, writer's analyst uh, Luke Mullender. He'll be coming on the show in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Talk Not to mention that. former Alouette. That's right. As well. I mean, he's definitely well known for being a big part of the, the Rough Riders during their glory years of a few few years ago. But uh, yet, Luke also played for the Alouettes too. So he understands just how important a game like this is. Yeah, for sure. And it's, I said, all the rest are big games because the Owls have a very, very tough three game stretch coming up mm-hmm. well i mean yes yeah, so i guess against the riders because they always play hard but they've you know they've had their struggles over the past few weeks uh, in playing the in playing the, the stampeders uh but winnipeg though i mean yes there's a home and home series against against the winnipeg blue bombers uh, who have essentially sewn up the western division and i have to wonder just how much of an effort are they going to put into these games considering it has absolutely no bearing on their standings within the league. Like we know they're going to be hosting the Western final in December. So I just have to wonder, like, are they going to be trotting out like all of their, uh, all their a players? Are they going to have, or are they just going to sort of coast? And if they do, is Montreal going to be able to take advantage of that? I don't know. I mean, they only have two games. Is, is it that is do they only have two games? They only have two games left, right? Because they played uh, eleven. They, are they nine and one? They're nine and one. They're ten and one. Oh, ten and one. So they played eleven. So they're a game up. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. So it's yeah. I, I don't know because I think I think it'd be too early to rest. I mean, remember this is different. This is the CFL. It's not the NFL. That type of thing. But we've seen we've seen things happen in the last week of the season, and it looks like it looks like. The last, the last home game versus uh, versus uh, Ottawa will be of some 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 importance. It won't be just one of those rest everybody type of games, especially if be- first places on the line or a home playoff. Right, unless somehow Montreal manages to beat both Saskatchewan and Winnipeg twice, and if in which case, then 
I think at that point that should be enough to have sewn up the Eastern Division. So, but we'll see. I mean, we, we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. I mean, it's def- but it's definitely food for thought though when you think about it. Yeah, we, I, I, exactly. I still think we have the, the toughest schedule coming up next, if I'm not mistaken, compared to Toronto and Hamilton. So, but but still, it's just a matter of what you do next. Just what you do next. That's all that matters. Well, I'm not going to doubt the Salo West team. I mean, they, they've definitely proven themselves over the past few weeks. I mean, they are. I think they're starting to catch fire at the right time. They got the momentum on their side. And, I mean, I, like I said, I, I'm really excited to see what uh, is going to happen this Saturday versus Saskatchewan because they're a good team, too. I mean, they, they're beatable, but, I mean, they, they're, they're definitely going to want to fight as well because they, too, like, as you said, can, can clinch a playoff position with a win on Saturday. Uh Again, they're gonna, nobody's going to catch Winnipeg, but I mean, like you still got you got Calgary to deal with. BC is not one hundred percent eliminated either, so I mean, it's uh, you know it's going to be a bit of a dogfight for for the riders as well. So I'm I got a feeling both these teams are going to be amped. They're going to be ready to go, and it's going to make for a great football game on Friday, uh, Saturday. Uh, yeah, I agree. Speaking of the, of the game uh, last week, uh, again, it was a it was a chilly one, to say the least. Um, you know, quite different than what it was the week prior and then the week prior to that because, you know, fall and Canada. Um, <laughs> it's football weather. That's what you got to say. It's football weather. Yeah, but the Alouettes do what they needed to do. I mean, they, they took it to, to Toronto 37-16. And one thing I, I hadn't checked before the game itself is that, you know, I think even though the Owls had won the last five or seven or something like that, the Owls have won like seven straight at home versus Toronto. I think it's something like that. It's something, yeah, I, it's something nuts. Yeah. In fact, uh, it was, fun fact, the last Toronto quarterback to beat the Alouettes at Percival Molson Stadium was Trevor Harris. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> How about that? Uh-huh. Exactly. Uh, 37-16 was the final. Uh, the And I'm only mentioning this specifically because of the – uh, the weather itself, but the weather did really play a factor with the crowd itself, even though I felt that we were quite loud and sounded that way on TV too, but it was only an announced 12,142. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and it looks like from what I'm seeing, because I still go, I go in from time to time and check our, our, our tickets. It looks like the Alouettes are going to go with, at least for the rest of the regular season, uh, a maximum of, uh, well, officially a 15,000, I think. I think because so far nothing has changed so far for the next couple of games. So, well, and, and I expect like theoretically they could open things up to everyone and they could be at capacity if they wanted to. I think it's just a matter of do fans actually still want to come out? Like are, if that's, uh, yeah. I, I, I wonder if, uh, I don't know if the, um, the current guidelines as far as uh, vaccine passport and wearing a mask, I don't, I don't know if those are deterring factors for some, I'm sure it's deterring factors for some people, but I have to believe it was just a matter of, okay, I don't want to sit out in the cold and damp weather on a Friday night kind of thing. And to me, like, I mean, like, well, it's football. It's, you know, it's not always played in sunny weather. So, I mean, like, you got to kind of take that into consideration. So, yeah, exactly. exactly. I, I'm my hope, my hope, and maybe it's, you know, a fool's errand at best, but uh, I, I sincerely hope, like, watching what this team has done will encourage more people to go out, especially to like the next game, which is this Saturday. It's a Saturday. So, I mean, it's, you know, you know, you don't have to work during the day in theory. So it's Saturday night. You come out, support your team. I mean, they're playing good football. Uh-huh. They, they need the fans there. You need to be there and making that noise. So, yeah, I, I sincerely hope that uh, fans do show up and show out. Uh, I know, especially to this game, Rider Nation always manages to come out. And I know there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, fans wearing green at these games there always is so i'm you know i'm curious to see just uh, what kind of a turnout we get on uh, on saturday yeah it'll be it'll be interesting but I, again looking at the current weather i mean just bundle up and come out and have fun that's all you can do so but that's really that's really it um the owls as i said i mean net offense for the alouettes i mean 417 yards i mean i think i saw a status from last week's game that, that the alouettes are are or like leaders in five different categories in the CFL, which is nuts to hear. <laughs> it's also great to hear. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, 417 yards, I mean, 7.7 yards per game held, held uh, Toronto to 321 yards. 
But it, you know, that really wasn't the story, though. I mean, obviously, as we mentioned before, you know, William Stambeck, I mean, he, he had the 203 yards, 24 carries. I mean, dude, that is, and now he leads the CFL again. He's the overall rusher, a leading rusher in the CFL. I mean, he averaged 8.5 yards a game, a game, uh, a carry. That's crazy. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's almost a guaranteed first down every time he touches the rock. It's that that's the kind of stat you love. That's the kind of thing you want to know that your your running back is capable of doing. And especially to uh, again, I think Matthew Schultz with each game has gotten more and more confident. But I think even he realizes, okay, I got a I got a great running back. I got a couple of great running backs in my lineup. I got to lean on those guys too. And it was great because even though Schultzy didn't have what I'd call like phenomenal numbers. No. Like what what he did do was good, but it was also smart of him to lean on that running game, especially too. If if these guys don't want to stop William Stanback, and quite frankly, I don't think I'd want to step in front of him either. But I mean, give him the rock. That's that's the best thing to do. And look, I mean, his longest rush was sixty five yards. I know, unbelievable. Like these guys couldn't ca- like these defenders for the Argos. They couldn't catch a cold. It was, yeah. Incredible. 65 yards, no matter what Boris Bede tried to do to him uh, or fake him out on the side on the sideline, which he Bede really did deserve the fine that he got. So, yeah, it was childish. And you know what? I, you know, he had some fun a few weeks ago in at BMO Field. He was, you know, kind of waving at the Alouettes bench as he was draining all those field goals. Like, OK, that's fine. You, you do that. That's fine. But uh you know, these things could end up coming back to you. And then to pull a stunt like he did, yeah, you, you definitely deserve uh, to be a little bit lighter in the wallet for uh, for nonsense like that. But, exactly. You know. As I said, Matt Schultz, it wasn't a, an outstanding game, but still, nonetheless, he was productive. I mean, 12 of 18 for 212 yards, no picks, two touchdowns, no, what, and those two touchdowns themselves, dude. <laughs> wow. Geno Lewis, man. Like that, those were money touchdowns. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, no matter what what fans say about the first one, after seeing the the replay, yeah, yeah he, I mean, Gino did have the hair, but the hair is part of the uniform. Well, exactly. If you got dreads like that, you you choose not to you know have them out, then that's part of the uniform. It's like grabbing a, a piece of the shirt and throwing you down. It's so. that that's just what it is. I mean, fair or not, we should have been should that have been offensive pass interference. Maybe possibly, I, you possibly. know, like it, I mean, like hand fighting is allowed at, at a certain point. So, I mean, it's like I said, it was a very gray area. Let's let's put it that way. I mean, I, I don't I wouldn't have been completely surprised if they took the touchdown off the board as a result, but they didn't. So I guess, you know, let them play. Isn't that what everybody keeps talking about is just let these guys play. Exactly. And that's what that's what they did. So and yeah. just beautiful touchdown yeah gino was perfect on the night i mean seven targets seven catches 156 and two he had the two touchdowns his other touchdown too by the way wouldn't have mattered anyways because there was not a defender anywhere around him you talk about blown coverage like what 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 happened there because whew, i mean Schultz, he just you know grip it and rip it he just let it fly and as soon as we saw gino's all by himself like w- wait what yeah like, Maybe you should cover this guy. I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, this is like one of the best receivers in the CFL, and you're just leaving him all by himself. I don't know. Like, I, I, far be it for me to tell Chris Jones how to do his job, but yeah, uh, yeah, you, you might want to get a guy on that, uh, that dude, yeah. or two even. Like, you, you think if anyone was going to get double teamed over and over again, it would have been Geno Lewis, but. Not on that play, anyways. Yeah. Like someone, someone got their wires crossed, but you know, I, doesn't doesn't bother me. Yeah. I'm all for that. <laughs> uh, Reggie White Jr. made his debut because Dante Absher was out. Um, and by the way, no, this is it's not the same Reggie White that people are thinking. This is not the this is not the guy who played in Green Bay. His father well, no, is, not, he, is not the guy. It's not the guy who played in Green Bay. Yeah, and there is actually a like that Reggie White did have a son named Reg, and also named Reggie White, but it's not. There is no relation yeah, between. No relation. Um, yeah. I, I think one of the um, one of the disappointments for the game, though, is is Jake Winicky. I mean, three, Jake. T- yeah, it, it, three. You know, three targets, no catches. Oh, could have had, but it dropped. I mean, it was like yeesh. 
Yeah, he was he was no TD Jake on this past Friday. Like, and the one he could have caught, had he caught that, he had nobody in front of him. But just, uh, just I don't know if he lost it in the lights or what happened. But uh, yeah, yeah, just unfortunate. And that breaks the streak too, because he was. I think this, this would have been his ninth streak game with a reception. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and I, just, and I think his fifth straight game with a TD. Yeah, so. I think. Unfortunate, but if anyone's going to bounce back, it'll be Jake Winecki. I, I, I feel confident about that. For sure. Um, one of the, you know, we're talking, cause there are always positives and negatives. I mean, for us uh, also, for in this game is, um, you know, specifically, as I said about Dante Absher. Sorry, it was the other way around. It wasn't Dante, Dante Absher. It was, uh, who, who was, uh, who did Reggie White start for? It wasn't Absher. Because Absher started. EJ. Huh? He was in place of B.J. Cunningham. There we go. For, yeah, place of B.J. Cunningham. But Absher, who came in, who's Alice cannot have, can't seem to be doing anything lately when it comes to that's one you know one of the negatives when it comes to punt return stuff. Absher goes out with a concussion. Yeah. Now he took a lick and uh, unfortunate. I mean, that's been one of the the big keys. Not having Mario Alfred in the lineup has definitely hurt the Alouettes in that department because. There's there's probably been so many great opportunities to take one to the house, and it just hasn't happened. And it's also affected like field position because you know, every once in a while you get someone that actually can break out a little bit, at least get if they get the ball to midfield at least that that gives a great opportunity for Matthew Schultz to go to work and and do his thing. But uh, there haven't been too too many good opportunities lately for the Alouettes to be able to do that, and it's it's a little troublesome. I you know listen, I mean it's some of these guys just aren't you know you expect. Guys like uh, Quan Bray and Greg Reed to do great things, and they do great things when they're on the field. But it's just returns. It's not necessarily their forte, so you know, you, got, you kind of have to take that into consideration a little bit. It's you know, not having an actual, honest to goodness returner for the past few weeks has been a challenge to say the least. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, defense was was amazing. I mean, so there's they were only held to three sacks overall, but they had four picks. Of uh, of um, McLeod Bethel Thompson, one being a on a, a two point conversion attempt, mm-hmm. uh, so four total for him. I keep forgetting it that those interceptions, those actually count as interceptions in the CFL. They don't count as interceptions <laughs> in the NFL, right? Um, but yeah, they, you know, Macbeth was McNormal. <laughs> well, as I said, like funny that his nickname is Macbeth and it turned out to be a Shakespearean tragedy for him this game. It just was <laughs> not, uh, not, not his finest hour, especially, uh, like the pick from Najee Murray, the, the pick six to essentially end the game. I mean, the game was over yeah. for the most part, but yeah. I mean, this was like the final nail in the coffin and just, wow. He just read the mail, took it right back to the house. Like, I mean, and he, and he, he did the bye-bye. Didn't he, yeah, he no, do the bye-bye? It, it, I'm really surprised he didn't get a flag for taunting on that one because he, you know, a little bye-bye wave to all the defenders. And it's funny because uh, C.D. Lamb of the Dallas Cowboys was actually dinged 10 grand by the NFL for a similar thing for scoring a touchdown, like a similar little wave to the uh, to his defenders as he was crossing the goal line. I thought, oh, Najee, oh, gosh, <laughs> you, 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 little, you must be feeling a little nervous. But sure enough, when the fines came out uh, th- today, no fines. So yeah. I, I guess that's encouraged <laughs> or at least not punishable. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm glad I'm glad for Najee that he didn't, you know, have this moment tarnished by, uh, you know, you know, a little slap on the wrist. But I was really surprised. I'm like, oh, OK, because that could be considered taunting. Yeah. But no flag was thrown. No fine was levied, so all right, carry on. Exactly. Um, the only other bad thing that that came across this game was David Cote. He has been pretty automatic this season. Yeah. He, if I'm not mistaken, before this game, he was perfect on extra points, and he was one of the league leaders when it came to field goals. Yeah, he which did, was which was one of his things going, especially too coming from uh, Laval Ruggiero, was his accuracy yeah. was among the very best in in all of U sports. Yeah, and, and it just so happened that you know one was wide, uh, and two, you know, one extra point at the end of the game, and one extra point, uh, one field goal, clanked off the uh, off the upright. Yep. Yeah. So 
I, I can't explain it. I, I guess, you know, just bad day at the office for him. It's unfortunate because, yeah, he's he's been money for the most part. And, you know, like as you said, practically automatic. But then for whatever reason, he just had the yips, I think, because bricked a couple of, like you said, a couple of just went off the, the crossbar. I'm like, oh, dear, that's not ideal. No. <laughs> but but what, what are you going to do? I mean, Boris Bede, too, like he came up short. I mean, kicking was not, you know. It wasn't a good night for kickers at uh, Personal Wilson Stadium this past Friday. No, no. But it, hey, at least it seemed that, that coat days were going to make it at least. That first one by uh, <laughs> by Boris Bede, I don't understand because that thing was just like over and over in the entire time. And, and it there seemed to be a little bit of wind in that part of the of the stadium during that during that drive. So it's I'm not surprised, but still, it was nice. Still. It was nice to see him miss at home. Yeah, and at least everybody in our section, they, they gave him the business. It was yeah. quite comical. You know, just like, you know, cat calling and jeering, like, oof, okay. Like, I, and that's the thing, like, Boris Bede was liked here in Montreal, I think, for the most part. And he had his off games. He had his moments where things just didn't quite work for him. And it happens. It, I think every kicker goes through that. Did I think it was fair? Maybe not, but... Uh, also, too, I do think about the fact that, you know, his, him taunting the Alouettes earlier at BMO Field. And I'm like, all right, you, you know, be, care, be careful. That, that, that'll, they'll come back to haunt you. And sure enough, it did. And as I said, one thing you say about Alouettes fans is they got a pretty good memory for stuff like that. And they will let you know. If you screw up, they will let you know that they, you screwed up. Mm-hmm. And that's really what it was. I mean, I can't speak for everybody else throughout the stadium, but at least in our section, they they were giving it to him big time. I'm like, oh yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. No. It, it was savage. <laughs> it it was it was deserved. It was deserved. Um, any other takeaways from this game? Positives, negatives? Uh, as you said, the the crowd noise was fantastic. I mean, yeah, twelve thousand, not ideal. I, I mean, again, I th- expect Montrealers to come out and support their their winning team. I mean. Lord knows the Canadians aren't doing much this this season so far. Uh, CF Montreal, they're they're hanging in there. At least they seem to be doing okay support wise. So I mean, there's no reason why fans can't come out and watch the Alouettes, you know, contend for first place and then end up with first place. But the fans that were there, they brought the noise, they brought the excitement. It was it made for a great atmosphere, yeah. and that's all we can ask for. Like there's still a couple of flubs here and there when it comes to the in game presentation, but I think for the most part. They've got it figured out, and I, I'm I'm really glad that they have taken some of our suggestions to heart. It seems like they're a little bit better now at trying to figure out when to make all the like have these little hype sessions and get people excited. Still seeing the wave on offense, though, I could definitely do without that. But again, this is this is a, a league wide problem, from what I've been told. Like lots of stadiums have this, where the team's on the offense and they're doing the freaking wave. Right. I just don't understand it. Like, I, I have no problem with the wave, but do it during the defense. It's not hard. Hey, we, at least we got country road in almost all the way through. We got two verses of it. I, I was <laughs> very impressed. And I, I threw up that video up on uh, Instagram and uh, and Twitter. And, man, so nice. I mean, I, I first of all, folks, I apologize for my singing. I was about to say, I, didn't it get banned? It, <laughs> it should have. I would have banned it. <laughs> For cruel like, you know, and unusual and cruel and unusual punishment. Oh, uh, I I will say though, singing through a mask is not easy. So maybe that no no, it's just a terrible voice. But you know, it is what it is. It won't happen again, folks. Just you know, uh, next time I'll, I'll take the video and I'll just I'll let everybody else you know chime in with their their singing and all that. And it's a thing of beauty. And it's this is quickly becoming Tim one of our traditions in Montreal. We don't have a whole lot of traditions when you think about it, but something like this, and it's so dumb because. I really don't like country music, but if I don't hear this song now at an Alouettes game, I will have a hissy fit. Like, it, that's just, would you really consider it country music, though? The song is called Country Roads. It I know, get any I more know, country. but still, it's not like it's Garth Brooks or anything like that. I mean, that's well, kind of, but then again, the way that they, with, with the way how country music artists are crossing over these days, you know, I, I, wouldn't you call that, I would call that song folk music. It's got a little in my opinion. To... In my opinion, right? But I mean, again, John Denver did sing mostly country songs. So I mean, like you know, like 
to me, I do consider that a country. I, I'll tell you what, I consider that a hell of a lot more country than that nonsense that TSN plays with that Stephen Lee Olson guy. Yeah. That, that crappy, you know, I, I don't know if that's supposed to be country music, but God damn, that sucks. I, I uh, And they play it over and over and over. And over. You're telling me you can't find other. P- people got like, tired of it, but you know what? I miss the rec laws. You heard it here. I miss the rec laws. Well, my question is, if you want to promote like Canadian artists and all that, and I'm all for that. I really am. And if, you, if it has to be country for whatever reason, maybe because once again, the prairies drive the CFL. Okay. I, I kind of get that to a degree, but at least mix it up, play some other people as well. Like why, like, like does Stephen Lee Olson's mom own TSN or something? Like, is there a reason why we have to listen to this dude over and over again? Oh well, yeah, because he's he's he, he's the voice, uh, or he's the music, or the song of the season, or whatever the hell the hell they call it. I mean, jeez, it's just. Uh, and I'm ha- sure it has to do. Much- I'm sure it has to do with whichever uh, music co- music company in Canada has sponsored. Like. How long until we we find out that Stephen Lee Olson ends up as the Greg Cup uh, halftime show? How much you want to bet? No, no. If anything, it would be similar to what the Rec Laws did. But you know what? I don't think it, his tra- he's not gotten as much traction as the Rec Laws did mm. at all. Well, I guess we'll see. I guess uh, when Hamilton uh, hosts the Grey Cup this year, I guess we'll see what uh, what's happening. But. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I just I wouldn't bet against it. I'm pretty sure he'll be front and center. If he's not the Great Cup Entertainment uh, at halftime, then I'm I'm pretty sure he'll be like the pre the pre concert like pre game concert or some something like that. But uh, like it or not, folks, I guess we're stuck with this guy. <laughs> but yes, all this to say that yes, as far as I'm concerned, John Denver is a country singer. Okay, or was a country singer. Okay, rest in peace. Yeah. Well. We got more to talk about, obviously. Some great news for, for when it came to the uh, CFL uh, awards this week, um, and a lot, mo- and a lot more. But first, we're going to get into the uh, into the uh, the game preview this week uh, with the Rough Riders. Uh, we're going to be speaking with writers analyst uh, Luke Mullender. He is uh, on a CKRM six twenty in Regina. So when we finish with him, and when we get back, we, as I said, we have a lot more to talk about. Mm-hmm. And with us this week to talk about the matchup this uh, versus the Saskatchewan Rough Riders is uh, Luke Mullender. He is the the writers analyst with CKRM six twenty in Regina. Hey, Luke, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, no problem, man. Uh, I'm looking forward to a good game. It'll probably be the game of the week uh, in the Canadian Football League. And uh, man, you guys are uh, you guys are really on a roll right now. So I'm looking forward to it. It should be fun. Uh, I think one, I think the the main question right now, I think that Alouette's fans are really wanting to know, is that uh, I know we're ready to play 60 minutes this time around. Are the Rough Riders ready to play 60 minutes this time around? <laughs> oh, man, you know what? I, yeah, like, I, I think that that whole, that was the first time in my entire, you know, career I had ever seen anything like that. I didn't even think it was possible. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope so. <laughs> well, I hope so, but uh, I tell you what, man. I think that uh, both teams are going to need all sixty minutes. Oh, for sure. It's uh, it's going to be a great matchup. Obviously, um, before we talk about the matchup, real quick, let's let's talk about what are your thoughts on, on the Rough Riders so far this season. I mean, obviously, your quarterback seems to be getting. He's in the news a little bit these days. I think he just came out saying he doesn't like smoke meat. Okay, yeah, whatever. I mean, we 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 can. Not everybody <laughs> likes smoke meat, but. Uh, uh, the way you're looking at the riders this year, how, how do you see them doing? Well, you know, I, I really think that, uh, you know, they're obviously, I think they're good enough to get into the playoffs, but uh, they've got to put a consistent sort of effort together here. Um, you know, I think that that's, that's sort of been um, their uh, Achilles heel is consistency. I think that there's been, there's been good times and spurts, but uh, again, you got to put it all together, right. To be a championship team. Um, you know, for instance, in Calgary, we saw spurts of what was needed, right. Uh, they, they were able to protect the quarterback at times. And, and when they did protect the quarterback, they were able to make plays, you know, they, they, they played some good defense, but uh, yeah, I think it's consistency for the Saskatchewan rough riders, but uh, to be fair to them, 
like every team, right? Like every team, they've they've done well with handling the indus- uh, injuries, the situation that they've uh, they've been hit with. Every team was going to deal with that again, as I said. But uh, you know, I, I think that they've uh, they've had some guys take advantage of the opportunity to get on the field a little bit more. Um, and now you just got to start putting it together. These last five games of the year, every single team, if you want to take uh, get to the Great Cup, you've got to be playing your best football at the end of this five game stretch. So. Um, this is a big one in terms of momentum because we've seen it out of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Now we want to see it all the time. For sure. Um, the, the, what, what do you see how the team's done during COVID? Obviously, it's a very strange season this year. You know, only only 14 games. You got to get really going right off the bat when it comes to uh, wanting to make sure that you are, you know, you're going to be competitive in your division. Um, for those who don't know, I mean, obviously we we fought other teams across the league itself. You know, Edmonton's had their issues and stuff like that, but. Um, what's it been like, uh, from your point of view, when it comes to, uh, the, the riders, when it came to COVID and getting used to the protocols and, or non-protocols, or whatever, depending on what the, what the, uh, uh province was doing, but, uh, how do you think that the team has handled, uh, uh that, t- that situation? Well, I think that, uh, I think that the, that there was no issue is a good thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that, uh, if we had ended up talking about the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, it would have been bad. I think that, um, you know, it's it's uh, it was a tough situation. You know, I mean, the league needed to play. Right, like the CFL is not to the point in their revenue uh, in their revenue scheme that um, they can afford to to miss consecutive years. So um, the league needed to play, but not only needed to play, man, they needed to finish the year. Yeah. You know, um, when we were looking at sort of the uh, the other side of the business model, you know, um, it was it was apparent that this league. You know, there was a certain average amount of fans that uh, the league needed to average, you know, throughout the year um, in each stadium. Um, And there was also a certain amount of games that the league needed to play. And that was only to, to, to break even. So, again, the fact that we didn't talk about the Saskatchewan Rough Riders is probably the best part about it. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, you know, even, you know, they've been luckily, you know, I, you know, I think the NFL had a few games moved last year, but that was obviously a different time, too, for for the situation. But, you know, luckily, the CFL has only been uh, only had to move one game this year. And and it seems that only Edmonton themselves have been the team that's really been hit the hardest. So, um, yeah. So, Cliff, go ahead. All right. Uh, look, uh, let's talk about uh, the relationship between Jason Moss and Cody Fajardo. What? What do you think makes it work so well, despite the fact that we've seen at times things have really clicked and at times they've been almost at uh, loggerheads? Yeah, I think that, um, I think that, uh, I think both have been very patient, more so Jason Moss. And I think that Jason Moss, the reason why, the reason why he's had, um, a lot of opportunity to, to be patient is, um, that he was, uh, he was, he understands how all the other, you know, he's had success with a number of quarterbacks. Um, well, two as, as most recently, right? If you look at what he did with um, Trevor Harris and you look what he did with the success he had with Mike Riley, it's two different things, right? He was airing it out with Mike Riley and, you know, with Trevor Harris, he was more, uh, more creating a scheme where it was managing the game. They were dinking and dunking a lot more, sort of like the uh, 2009 Montreal Alouettes. So, again, I think that Jason Moss came in here with an open book and with a plan to see, hey, what is Cody's skill set and how do I utilize his skill set best in this scheme? And um, it's looked a lot more like um, Trevor Harris than it, has, um, than, uh, than it has looked like Mike Riley. But, again, I think that that's what's made it manageable. I think Cody's, you know, Cody's got to start making plays downfield. Um, but again, a lot goes into making plays downfield, right? You got to be protected. Your receivers got to catch the ball. So that's why I think that, you know, these next five games, specifically this Montreal game is really, really important to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders because you got to start putting it together. And, um, you know, now that this team has guys like Duke Williams, they've got Shaq Evans back, you know, and then that was probably the main sort of thing with, with everybody in Rider Nation is, oh, well, you know, we're missing the deep ball and we need receivers. Well, now you got them. Right, so now that you got them and and your your own line has shown that they can protect the QB, well, guess what? You got to put it together, and it's uh, 
you got to get some points. And Montreal is not a team that's going to going to be messing around, right? I think that they're going to come out, they're going to try to control the tempo and uh, run the ball. And I think that uh, that's even more reason why the uh, the passing game has to work for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders against you guys, um, because we can't we can't have the two and outs, right? The two and outs will bury us against Montreal, I think. Mm-hmm. Now, talk to me about uh, the national receivers you guys have on your team, like Braden Lenius and Keon Schaefer-Baker. These guys have been outstanding this year for the Riders. What's been the key to this, their success this year in uh, working in Jason Moss's scheme? Wow. You know what? I, I, a number of things go into that. First of all, uh, you know, I was I was blessed to be able to play with Rob Bag, Andy Fantuz, Chris Getzlaff, right, especially in that era of, of uh, the Canadian Air Force. And, um, you know, I'm, if I'm being honest, this group of Lenius, Picton, Schaefer, Baker, and McKinnis, they've got a chance to be better than the Air Force. They're more athletic. Um, they're not as smart yet, but that's just because they're young. They don't have the football IQ. But, man, can they catch everything. You know, these guys don't drop the ball, man. And, uh, and, and I think that, yeah, they've got potential to be a lot better than the Canadian Air Force. Um, but that's going to take some work. And I think that the nice part about it is, and this is sort of answering your second part of your question, is they've gotten the opportunity. You know, when they came into camp this year, there wasn't a bunch of guys that were sort of ahead of them, right? We knew Kyran Moore was going to be a guy that uh, this, this team relied on and a weapon that Jason Moss could figure out how to use. But after Kyran, there was only Shaq, right? And, 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 and even Shaq, you know, he was having some, you know, he was, he was a guy that you, you probably didn't need at camp. You know what I mean? So he didn't need the opportunities because we all know what Shaq Evans can do. So they got the opportunity this year. And that's what made, that's what really makes these guys special is you guys know, you've seen it all the time, man, that window of opportunity only clo- opens and closes, you know, at certain times for guys. And, and I was really pleased with the way every single one of these guys took advantage of their opportunities, specifically in training camp, man. They came out and they made play after play after play. I'll tell you, Braden Lenius was probably the best receiver in camp, and that's with everybody, not just Canadians. So this is they've got a lot of potential there. And, again, you know, for me, having seen the Canadian Air Force with Van Tuz and those guys, to, to be able to say confidently, hey, if things go right, they can be better than the Air Force, that's a compliment to those guys and, and how hard they're working. Wow, that's a pretty bold statement because, yeah, the Canadian Air Force uh, in its time was absolutely outstanding. So if you're telling me these guys have the potential to not just equal but even surpass them, that that's some, that's yeah. if I'm a Riders fan, that's that's good news to hear. That's what I want to hear from my, oh, for sure, my receiving corps. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. They've, uh, you know, and, and J.O., you know, the, the, there's a lot of questions that I know people want answered out of Jeremy O'Day, but uh, – you know, him drafting, getting this amount of talent at that wide receiver spot, he needs some credit for that because they, they've done a good job. Okay. Uh, what are some of the keys that you think it's going to take for for the Riders to beat Montreal this Saturday? What do you think is going to be the most important thing that the Riders are going to have to do, whether it's on offense, defense, or even special teams? Well, for special teams, they're just going to have to do what they, they, they've been doing for the last few years. Their cover teams have been outstanding. And uh, it's, they've really been the most consistent part of, of, of the Craig Dickinson era. Um, so it's, it's the special teams just got to keep doing what they're doing. Defensively, we've got to stop the run. Simple as that. You guys have an, an outstanding running game. You've got a great offensive line that love, likes to likes to get in there and, and, and get their hands dirty. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the part of the, the game that, that I really enjoy watching uh, because, again, if, if you're able to control the tempo and, and – and, you know, the pace on the line of scrimmage by dominating your opponent, that's going to take you a long way in a game. So first and foremost is, is, is stop the run for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And, you know, you've got a good receiving core. And I think that, uh, you know, you, you, I think Schiltz is starting to get comfortable. Um, you know, we're in, a, we're in a phase, guys, you know, that I've noticed where we're, we're, we're in such a rush for young quarterbacks to develop. And, and here's what I mean. You know, we, we've, we've seen the guys like Mike Riley. We've seen the Bo Levi Mitchells, Fajardo, you know, guys, um, Caleros. Some of the best quarterbacks in this league ever to play have been guys that have sat there and learned the game and, and have gotten the opportunity. They haven't been forced in there in their first couple of years and just, you know, ex- essentially been set up to fail. And that's what I like about Schiltz. Schiltz has had his opportunity. Um, he's getting it again. But, again, he, he's had a chance to sit there and study. And he's waited. And, and he looks a lot more comfortable this time around. 
um, at the helm of the offense. So, yeah, I think that um, if the riders aren't careful and, um, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're able to put you guys in, in second and seven plus situations, it's going to be interesting to see if they can generate some turnovers. You know, for you guys, you've got to stop our D-line. That's a really good defensive line, and I know you guys got good guys up front, but um, some of the pressure that uh, A.C. Leonard and and um, and uh, Woodard and, and even the interior guys have been able to put on quarterbacks in second down has been impressive. So I think we got to have some success there. And then offensively, guys, just like I mentioned early on, man, it's consistency. you got to put the drives together, and, you, you know, you, you can't have it hot you know for four or five plays and then go cold for three or four yeah i think uh, consistency is going to be the key and also too i think this battle is going to be won in the trenches regardless of who takes it i think it'll definitely be which defensive or offensive line ends up showing up big time on saturday it always is brother trust me from a former d-lineman it always is one <laughs> lot in the trenches man and, and uh there. and you guys are you guys hey and you, you know it's gonna be fun to see Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, as, as as you know, we mentioned to you before, and we, we wanted to hear you see, hear if you had any stories about it. you know John Bowman this week is going to be. Uh, we're going to give him a, a little bit of ceremony and give him the the goodbye that he actually deserves. I really think he deserved a little bit more of a of a goodbye. You know, but you know, COVID got in the way, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we were wondering if there are any stories that you can tell about John Bowman that uh, can be actually uh, uh, told to the fans right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, man, you know, um, I, I was, when, when you guys told me that I was so pleased, I was so happy. If there's anybody in the league, you know, John, John, you know, Bo was the most consistent defensive lineman, um, in his stretch in the Canadian football league, you know, and, and that goes along, that, that's what says a lot because he played for a long, long time. And, you know, that's the key between, you know, being great and being good. It's, it's the consistency in which you go about and, and you produce. And there's nobody better than Bo, man. Um, he was – it's funny because he doesn't – and he might get mad at me for saying this, but there was nothing outstanding about him athletically. He wasn't the tallest guy. He wasn't the fastest guy. He wasn't the most athletic guy. But I'll tell you what he did have, man. He had – A, he, he trusted his technique. Right. He knew who he was as a player and nobody worked harder. Nobody had more heart, man. And, and uh, I'll tell you what, I competing against him was one thing, you know, and, and, and they got the better of us in two great cups. Um, but I remember when I played for the Alouettes in 2012, you know, I was really I was really sort of I didn't know what to think of getting into that locker room. Right. We had gone through the 13th man thing and, you know, 2000. 2010, we, we had run into you guys again and you beat us again, and I was a big part of that rider team. Um, and the first, the guy who made me feel most at home very early on was Bo, man. And I really appreciated him, dude. Uh, you know, and 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 it wasn't just you know the the fact that he that he you know he treated me um, like a great teammate that he was. It was that man. He was such a good great leader. And Montreal, the guys, the guys. Some of the guys like S.J. Green and John Bowman specifically, they don't get enough credit for being the leaders that they were. Um, and, and, and that's something that I think went, got sort of lost in all of his greatness. It got lost in the stats. It got lost in, you know, the, the, the pomp and circumstance of how good he was on the field. But I'll tell you what, man, John Bowman, as good as he was on the field, I would, I would want – 53 John Bowman's in my locker room. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that's the ty- type of guy he was, man. And, and it was great. I, I, you know, 2012, we didn't, we didn't get past Toronto in the, in the Eastern final, but I'm serious, man. I knew I was retiring after that year and it was probably one of my favorite seasons. Um, and, and Bo was a big part of that. You know, I, I learned so much from, from him, even in the twilight light of my career, um, I learned I learned a lot from him, man, and and that's what you, that's all you can do as a, as a as a professional athlete. Every year you got to be able to learn something, and you know you got to be able to get better. And you know, uh, do I regret not being able to play more years with Bo? Yeah, absolutely. But man, I don't regret one minute I, I spent with the guy because he was as solid as they come, man. I can't say enough good things about him, and I'm not just saying that because he's retiring, man. I, I really mean that, man. He was one of the best teammates that I've ever been around. Yeah, we're yep. not sure if the team is actually going to, you know, Cliff and I have talked about it before, if they're going to re- retire his number or if they're going to start with the, you know, the new, the the wall of fame type of thing, you know, since there are so many numbers so yeah. far that have been, uh, but 
Uh, I think both Cliff and I agree that we think that once he does become uh, eligible, he will be a, a, a first ballot Hall of Famer for sure. Oh, man, that's, yeah. You think? Hey, that's the first thing that's happening. <laughs> that's, that's not even a question, fellas. That's definitely happening. You yeah. know, uh, hey, uh, there's certain guys that you could probably uh, you could probably ignore the timing rule on, and Bo's one of them, man. Uh, again, I got so much respect for the guy. I'm so glad. Uh, it was. I can't tell you one story. Do we have time? I can tell you one story. Quickly. Yeah, for sure. I'm not sure he's going to remember this, but uh, my first uh, my first game with the Alouettes in Montreal. Um, so we were, we were at halftime and, um, and this was, uh, yeah, this was 2012. We were at halftime and I don't think Bo's going to remember this, but I, uh, I was one of the first ones into the locker room at the halftime and the dressing room smelled like cigar smoke. And I was like, man, what in the hell? Who is right? And I got mad. I'm like, dude, this is the worst, man. I'm, you know, like, I, yeah, man, I was never the cardio king, right? So I want to be able to breathe fresh air at halftime, you know, and it, it smelled like a cigar. And I got mad, and I was like, who the hell is smoking a cigar in here? <laughs> it was hilarious. Keep in mind, it's my first year, fellas. There's the, so I, I look to my left, and there's a guy sitting on the thing. And before I could recognize who it was, Bo goes to me, taps me on the shoulder. He's like, yeah, that's the guy who signed your check. And it was Mr. Wettenhall. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking his cigar. And I just said, oh, yeah, I guess he can do whatever he wants. Never mind, I'm good. You know, I'm good. But, uh, yeah, just, man, I, I'm so happy for Bo. He, he deserves everything that you guys are going to do for him this weekend. That's great. That's a good story. That's a good story. That's, a, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, and I can't say I'm surprised. Knowing Mr. Wettenhall like I do, I, or I did, oh. I should say, my God, that, that, that sounds God like... That's, him, man. Was, and yeah. he thought it was... I think Mr. Wettenhall thought it was kind of funny, too, right? Like, you know, and... Yeah, I just I just quickly went about my business and hope I didn't get cut after the game. <laughs> yeah, just sort of like, yep, sort of, no, my bad. Okay, just carry on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly how it was, man. It was like, oh, yeah, yeah, keep, continue on. How's it going, Mr. Whitenall? You know what I mean? Thanks for the team barbecue you guys uh, threw for us in the summer. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, well, look, I'm really looking forward to this game on Saturday. I know you are, too. Uh, I always love listening to you and Derek uh, call the action for Riders fans. And, uh, you know, uh, if you want to take a couple of minutes, uh, let people know how they can find you on social media, how they can find you on, on the radio, so to speak. Oh, man. You know, Luke Mall, on, Luke Mall 95 on Twitter, Luke Mall on Instagram. Yeah, you know what? Uh, on, honestly, it's social media these days is crazy, man. I'm not that active on it anymore. I, I try to keep my mouth shut and not get fired. You know what I mean, fellas? But, uh, but yeah, you know what? I'm really looking forward to, uh, to being in Montreal and you know what? Uh, it's, it's the most, I played eight games there as a rider and we only won two of them. And it's, and it didn't matter how good you guys were. It's always one of the toughest buildings to play in always. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it because I think that there's a, a ton of implications here on the line uh, it should be a great one. Mm-hmm. Well, playoff fever, man, is it's coming. So we got we got to be ready for it, whether it's uh, for Ryder Nation or for Alouette's Nation. <laughs> look, thank it, you, man. I'm ready to roll. Yep. All right, look, look. Thank you so much for joining us. We definitely appreciate it, and uh, you know, all the best for the rest of the season. Nice to catch up with you, boys, man. Have a great show. Always like talking. Pre and not always the pregame football. It's always great to see what it's like from the other side. Um, even though they are our arch enemies once the game kicks off. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely a blast to ch- talk with Luke. Uh, get his perspective on things, at least from a writer's perspective. So we definitely appreciate him joining us this evening. Uh, you know, absolute blast. Uh, if you if you're out. You know, looking to listen to the radio. I mean, obviously, you know, we're going to back our guys, uh, Sean Campbell and Mark Olivia Bruyette. But if you want to get things from a writer perspective, make sure you check out Derek Taylor and look on the uh, on CKRM as well, because they they do a phenomenal job calling the writers games. Yeah, exactly. Uh, before we continue, I want to remind everybody uh, we are on social media, many, many places where you can catch us. You can catch us over at Twitter at uh, Alouette's FL Deck. You can also catch us over on Instagram and Facebook. And, and our, also our iLily accounts. That's where you get 15 seconds of us chatting about the Owls and the CFL in uh, little itty-bitty bits, but you get a lot, of, a lot within those 15 seconds. Um, 
If you want to listen to any of the previous archive of all the Alouette Flight Deck episodes, you can do so by heading over to Alouette's www.alouettesflightdeck.ca or any of the other podcast aggregates that are out there. Right, Cliff? Absolutely. And don't forget, folks, we are also on YouTube as well. Make sure you search Alouette's Flight Deck in the search box and you will be brought to not only this episode that you're currently listening to, but several others. And once again, we have to remind everybody that we are a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. Uh, lots of great shows on there as well. I mean, things are definitely in full swing as you know teams get ready for the playoffs and all that. Uh, some great content out there. Make sure you check it out. Uh, you can follow them on Twitter at CFPod Network. Like I said, we're very happy to be a part of that network and just happy to be able to bring all the great content, not just for the Alouettes, but for the Canadian Football League as well. And before we talk about um, uh, the CFL Awards this week, uh, we want to reward you, the fans, by giving away another shirt courtesy of our presenting sponsor, Sport Buff. Um, we, I will make sure that I put it out this weekend, uh, this week, on what you will be, uh, w- you'll be winning. But all you have to do, like you have all season is that you will just have to reply to the either to uh, our uh, uh, announcement for the podcast or to the actual contest itself. But you just got to make sure that you reply uh, with the hashtag sport buff contest and we'll have a winner and make sure that we announce it next week. Yeah, and this is the time of year, folks. I mean, if you don't have your swag, I mean, this is the time of year to get it because the Alouettes are going places. We're we're looking at the playoffs. I mean, you want to be ready for that. So, I mean, what better way to get ready for a potential playoff run than with some of that sweet, sweet merch from Sport Buff? Exactly, exactly. Guys, uh, you know, Chris and Gary, they are they're great guys. Known them for a while, and, uh, you know, uh, to me, Sport Buff is, is a name in Montreal that – is synonymous with sports and sports merchandise. So, uh, again, thanks thanks to them for being a uh, uh, for being a presenting sponsor for for the show. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I didn't find out, but I'm trying to remember the last time that the Alouettes actually swept the CFL Weekly Awards. Uh, God, if they've done it before, it's been so long that I literally don't remember. I mean, it's. It's phenomenal. Not once, not twice. You usually find at least an Alouette once on a list every now and again. Mm-hmm. Sometimes twice, but all three spots, that, that, that that's unheard of. Yeah, it, It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess kind of speaks to the level of the games that were played over this, the past weekend. I mean, I guess Montreal-Toronto was the most interesting and entertaining because, yep, three Alouettes were nominated as Players of the Week. Which is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah, exactly. Obviously, William Stamick for his huge performance uh, and his 203 yards. Uh, Eugene Lewis, wide receiver uh, for his, uh, you know, for his catch and for his total 156 yards. Uh, by the way, that was a career high. Career high 156 yards. Mm-hmm. And two tutties. I mean, that's phenomenal for, for Gino. Yep. And then there's Money Hunter. He <laughs> was an absolute beast this week. Yeah, living up to his name. He was money, all right. He was definitely money with those two picks and just throwing his weight around. I mean, he was hunting, too. Like, I mean, let's say he literally lived up to his name. He was money and he was hunting. He was hunting Macbeth pretty much the entire game. And he was making him pay left, right, and center. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, right. huge, huge congratulations to William, to Gino, and to money because those three guys are a big reason why the Montreal Alouettes are currently sitting in first place in the CFL's Eastern division. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I should have checked. I, was, I should have checked who it was. I, I didn't even think of seeing the last time that we may have swept. If, if those type of stats are actually kept. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, before we get to our preview of the game, um, just want to at least mention as if we were taping this show, uh, the injury report came out, I don't know if there are really any surprises on this one. I mean, Asher actually was in full participation, which is good to see that he pay, that he passed all concussion protocols. Mm-hmm. So it's very possible that he will be returning uh, kicks again this week. 
Uh, Cameron Artist Payne, uh, even though he was a, he was a healthy scratch because of, of an illness, he was a full participation. Makes me wonder what's going to happen with Stambic going off for 200 plus. Makes me wonder if uh, Artist Payne doesn't make the roster this week. I mean, that, that's a good problem to have. But I mean, it's, it's, it almost seems criminal to sit Cameron Artist Payne considering how good he's been like two games previous to, you know, the two games previous that he played, played phenomenal football. Mm-hmm. Or what kind of mental gymnastics will the the coaching staff have to do in order to get both William Stanback and Cameron Artis Payne in the lineup? I mean, that's that would be a great problem. That's a great problem to have. Yep. But you know, does that mean you sit Jeshua Nantrui and then you play with the raw the the ratio some more? I mean, it's I don't envy Kahari and the crew trying to make this decision because to me it doesn't make sense to bench either of these guys. Yeah, but to get them both in the game and get them get them reps. Like, how do how do you do it? How do you what kind of what kind of game plan do you have to come up with, and what kind of roster juggling are you going to have to do in order to make that happen? Exactly, exactly. Uh, David Brown uh, elbow did not participate. Philip Gagnon lower leg did not participate. Um, anybody else who was? Uh, those are the only two that did not participate. Uh, obviously, Trevor Harris, healthy scratch, because COVID protocol, and then and uh, anyway, he was still in COVID protocol when the rosters were made. So, but I just like you, Cliff. I expect him. He probably will be the backup this week. Mm-hmm. Um, Taekwon Glass, uh, full participation. Uh, Cameron Lawson, full participation. A lot of these guys were healthy scratches. Uh, Frederick Plissus is uh, is a hip. He was limited. He's one of the uh, Wesley Wesley Sutton full participation. We got Samuel Thomason who is coming off the sixth game. Tony Washington seems to s- still be hampered by that knee, but he has limited participation. But I would not be surprised if he is in the starting lineup. And then Trey Watson uh, for full participation, even though he was a healthy scratch. Any surprises? Uh, Mind you, we still have one more to go. One more, <laughs> one more mm-hmm. uh, injury report to go, but. We do, but uh, so far everything is where I expected to be. Uh, like I said, obviously not surprising. Uh, Trevor Harris is now taking reps with the team. Uh, like I said, the the plan was to have him dress as the backup for Matthew Schiltz. I mean, listen, you, you for what you gave up to get him, you got to get him at least participating, <laughs> if nothing else. I mean, again, I'm still very much of the belief that we're not going to see him play unless Schiltz gets hurt. Yeah. And again, after the past two games, how do you tell Matthew Schultz to, you know, ride the pine and let this other guy c- come in? No, it's not happening. I'm sorry. It, I really, truly believe it's going to take an injury. I mean, unless, you know, Schultz completely falters, like big time, like just like is throwing nothing but interceptions, which I just don't see happening either. This is Matthew Schultz's team now. And Trevor Harris says he's willing to participate in whatever role the team needs him to do. Well, it just may have to be clipboard duty and, you know, maybe short yardage if you're lucky kind of thing. Like that's, that's just what it is. Yeah, exactly. So we'll, we'll see if he's, you know, we'll see how much of a, a game, a team player he is and how much, how much is he willing to contribute to this team to help out? Even if it's, you know, not what he's used to because he started the year as a starting quarterback and now he's essentially a backup. Yeah. So we'll see how that uh, dynamic works out. But uh, again, we cannot overstate this enough. This is Matthew Schiltz's team, and he ha- has earned, earned the right to keep this, his starting job. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, on uh, uh, two days ago, uh, on Monday, the Allowoods put out some transactions. And it's funny, whenever I see the transactions now, I'm like, oh, Nord, now what? Um <laughs> Uh, but the Owls did release four, signed three. They released Zach Greenberg, uh, Jermaine Pounder, a defensive back, uh, Rashad Ross, a wide receiver who tried at doing uh, returns, and then Austin Simmons, a quarterback out of South Dakota. Uh, didn't need another quarterback when we just signed another one. Um, <laughs> and do you know anything about these three that we did sign? And uh is it Quabina Asari? I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that properly. 
that it, would be it. Yes. Oh, nice. Uh, o liner out of uh, out of Carlton. Uh, Rashad, Cl- is it? Oh God, I'm, I'm going to say Cleet. Cleet, yep. Yeah. A uh, uh, linebacker out of South Florida, and then Martise Jackson, a running back out of Florida and Florida Atlantic. Well, Martise Jackson started his CFL career with the Alouettes, right. and I think this is going to be the solution to the woes that we were just talking about earlier when it comes to uh, kick and punt returns. Okay. I think Martise will be a great solution because the guy's got wheels. And let's face it, the Yellowwoods need someone that can return kicks and punts until Mario Alford comes back. And Martise Jackson is definitely someone who can carry the load. He's definitely someone who has done this before in the CFL and done it very successfully, I might add. So it's kind of nice to see him back in the fold. And I'm excited to see once he completes his COVID protocol and gets back into it, uh, you know, I don't think we'll see him. I'm, we're not definitely not going to see him this Saturday. But no. uh, I mean, as far as you know, loading up for the playoffs, like having someone with that kind of experience at, in special teams is definitely a good thing to have. And I think Martinez will definitely be excited at the prospect of coming into this Alouettes team and being able to contribute right away. When is Alfred supposed to be scheduled to come off the sixth game? Uh, well, I'm trying I mean, to how many. I'm trying to remember how many weeks it's been. He's got to be close. I mean, I'd even go so far as to say maybe next week he might be coming off, but uh, I guess I guess we'll see. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not 100 sure. Um, game this week is at seven o'clock, it's not at seven thirty. And as we were talking with Luke uh, earlier, the Owls and it looks like he's going to be in town, which is fantastic to to see. Uh, John Bowman's going to be in town because the Alouettes are going to give him uh, a proper send off. Um, so to speak. Uh, yeah, a, cel- a celebration of the absolutely phenomenal career that he had. So, sort of a way of saying thank you to him for his years, his years of dedicated service, which is definitely well deserved. Uh, so unfortunate he didn't get a chance to get the send off that he should have gotten last year, but you know, COVID, you know, definitely played a, a major, major role in that. So. Yeah. It's definitely nice to know. And again, if you follow to, follow his Instagram, uh, he, he definitely has been cleared, and I believe he is definitely in Canada now. So he's he will definitely be at the game, folks. That's that's exciting, and you know I'm I'm looking forward to everybody there showing him the love, showing him the respect uh, for everything he's done for Alouette's Nation. So it's it's definitely cool, and I know that Luke was really excited too because he's as you heard he's played with he's played against and played with Bowman and. Nothing but respect, which is phenomenal to hear. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what this team does as a way of saying thank you to, to John Bowman for everything he's done for this team. For sure. I'm curious to see what they're going to do because obviously, you know, they, they had the Michael Souls tribute last week. They had the, uh, the celebration for Marv Levy. You know, it was kind of muted, obviously. I mean, even though the family, it was great to see the family, Michael Souls there uh, on the field last week. Uh, I'm curious to see what what will be done with this, but at least uh, you know, at least John is there, and uh, uh, it'll be it'll be cool to see. So definitely, and as I said, well well deserved, and I, I no question he's a, a first ballot Hall of Famer. That that's a slam dunk right there. Will they retire his number one day? It's really hard to say. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of long serving Alouettes who <laughs> didn't get their number retired. So I mean, like and. Suffice to say, you'd have to be an absolutely phenomenal player to get your number retired nowadays. And that's not to say that Bowman was not a phenomenal player, but it's such a weird thing right now with, when it comes to retiring numbers. I mean, like, just if you retire his number, then why didn't you retire, say, Brian Chu, for example, who played his entire career in Montreal, won Grey Cups as well, and was such a huge contributing factor to the success of the Alouettes. His number's not retired. Uh, Chip Cox for a time. Same idea. Played his entire career in Montreal, won great cups, contributed so much to this team. His number is not retired because you can't retire everybody's number. I mean, it, at that point, it kind of cheapens the whole idea of retiring the number. But at the same time, how else are you going to salute these guys? How else are you going to pay that ultimate tribute other than putting them into the Hall of Fame, which those guys that I mentioned absolutely 100% belong in the Hall of Fame and I have no doubt will be in the Hall of Fame when their time comes. So that's one way of paying your respects to someone like that. But 
when you start talking about Jersey retirements, it's it's such an iffy subject because absolutely without question, like when you talk about Alouettes from our era, like this current era that we're in right now, absolutely. Anthony Calvillo and Ben Cahoon, those are like no brainers, oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Past that, beyond that, that's where that's where it gets really, really tricky because yes, the, the men the men that I mentioned made absolutely amazing contributions to this team, and they are household names, and they are very much a part of the Montreal sports lore. But and, it, it's so hard. Like yes, we want to pay tribute to them, but retiring the number, I mean, it's it's tough because there's a, there's already been quite a few numbers retired for the Alouettes. Sooner or later, you're you're going to run out of numbers. Like that's 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 the scary part. Yeah, no, that that's true. I mean, what's the? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd say. Well, I'm sure they'll do them right. That that's the main thing. So, I mean, that is one thing I do feel confident in is that the Alouettes certainly will give John the love and the respect that he richly deserves. I I do feel very confident about that. And I fully expect all the fans that are going to be in attendance, they're going to be showing him the love too. Even writers fans have to, you know, begrudgingly tip their cap to him because he, he loved playing against the writers. He loved giving them hell. And, you know, there were some wars there and he was a big part of it. And, you know, I, I, I got a feeling that the writers fans that'll be in attendance, I got to believe they're going to give him his props as well. Oh, I think so too. I think so too. And, and speaking of the game itself, uh, yeah, the Alouettes come into this one obviously on a four-game win streak. Um, they have won the last six of ten versus the Riders at home, but lost the last two. Even though, yes, yes, there's an asterisk as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you know, I'm sure people are rolling their eyes <laughs> because I am. I am so hoping that there is a full sixty-minute game. Hey. If the writers want to stop playing halfway through the third, I'll be more than happy to allow them to do so. So, I, I couldn't think of a better tribute to that game than for the writers to not play the entire thing. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but it won't be easy. I mean, again, let's not forget both Montreal and Saskatchewan are in a position to clinch a playoff spot with a win. So, I'm pretty sure they don't need motivation. But if they did, that would be incredible motivation is mm-hmm. to know that the winner of this game will be a participant in the Grey Cup playoffs. Yes. If that doesn't get Montreal fired up, if that doesn't get the Riders fired up, I don't know what will. So, I mean, there's, you know, this is a big game. This is definitely a big game. And that's why I sincerely hope that, you know, Montreal shows up and shows out like the fans need to come out. They need to make the noise because, you know, Rider Nation is going to be there. They always show up for these games in Montreal. So I sincerely hope Alouette's nation shows up as well and brings noise and and makes this, once again, a very scary place to play. Exactly. Anything more that you can add to what Luke said earlier for, for this matchup itself? Because yeah, th- th- this, this matchup should be fun. It should. And also, too, like Saskatchewan was able, finally able to beat the the Stampeders after playing them three times in the month of October they finally get that that win and they've got to be feeling good about that I mean like Saskatchewan they've got so much talent on that team and Cody Fajardo is like this team lives and dies by Cody Fajardo just the same way that the Alouettes lived and died by Vernon Adams I mean if Fajardo has himself a game then Alouettes fans should be worried because that means the Riders stand a very good chance of winning. Like he's got so many weapons at his disposal. Uh, this defense of the Riders too. I mean, they, they've been making plays as well. So, I mean, th- this is going to be a very hotly contested affair. Like I, I'm really curious to see who's going to win out. Like, I, mean, I think defensively, I think Montreal's got the edge on offense. I think just by the slightest of margins, Saskatchewan might just make it out. I mean, this, this is a game that's going to be one in the trenches. As I said, with look is that, this defensive line and offensive line for both teams are going to have to play the game of their lives, as far as I'm concerned, if they want to get the win, because it's going to be a hotly contested affair, as far as I'm concerned, and fun. I think this is going to be a really fun game to watch, win or lose. No, oh, I agree. I agree. It should be fun. Um, early line, I think, has, I think at one point, I think it was Saskatchewan was favored by one and a half. 
double checking as we speak. It is still one and a half. That's the sky. So, so the Alouettes are a home dog, a home underdog. And the over under is 46.5 points. The, the, the good thing go, if you think about it, Cliff, that, that at least the Owls will know unless if they want to know what the result is of the Toronto BC game before kickoff mm-hmm. or just right after kickoff. So, right. And I, don't think that again. I don't think they really need motivation to win this game personally, but I think if, if somehow BC is able to put it together and somehow beat the Argos, I mean that puts Montreal in a very good spot. So because again, if the Argos win, they do clinch a playoff spot. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, I, I don't think Montreal wants to go into this game knowing full well that Toronto was able to punch their ticket, and if they don't, be, if they don't do likewise. Not a good look. So it'll be really interesting to see how they, when they take the field, where where things are at. And I, again, I, I just don't see how the Alouettes don't get motivated for this game. I think both teams are going to come into this hot as a pistol. I think they're gonna, both going to want to show that they can win important games. Yeah. Especially Matthew Schultz. Because he's still hearing it. I'm sure he's still hearing it. And now with Trevor Harris on the, on, on, on the sidelines, like people are aren't going to be clamoring for him right no, away. I mean, no, but they won't. I said that last they week. No, they're not. They're not. But it's still there. It's still going to be in his head just a little bit. But I think that as we've seen, he gets up for the big games. He he knows what he has to do to win. And if he just goes out there, works his plan as we've seen him do the past two games against Ottawa and Toronto. If he does the exact same thing, Alwood's going to walk out of, out of Percival Bolson with a W. And they'll get that playoff spot. And it's going to be great. But I, I think that's really what it comes down to is he, he's got to play exactly the same game he played against Toronto. Make those great throws and lean heavily on your running back or backs uh, if things work out the way we kind of like, kind of hopefully like to see happen. It would, it would be nice to see, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know if we're going to. I don't think so either, 100%. But imagine if somehow they find a way to get both William Stanback and Cameron Artis Payne in. Riders won't be able to stop both of them. I mean, that's a that's a deadly one-two punch as far as I'm concerned. And if that's the case, you know Matthew Schultz is going to lean on those guys, and I'm pretty sure they'll deliver for him, just like uh, you know the, this receiving core too. I, I think Gino is going to have himself another big game as well. Uh, he's got to go off again, and I, I think Schultz is ready to make it happen. And once again, with everybody watching, like. But he's thriving in these pressure situations and I'm here for it. And this just vindicates everything that I've said. Like you just have to give him a chance and he will succeed. And he's done that. He's, he's beat. Okay, fine. He beat the red blocks who are not great, but he also beat the Argos who are considerably better. So if he can get that win against Saskatchewan, I mean, the sky's the limit as far as I'm concerned. And at that point you take that good momentum and you're going into a home and home with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, who may or may not be playing 100%, knowing full well that they've got their their playoff ticket punched a long time ago. I mean, this is this is all just good stuff that could happen. Like this is all, as far as I'm concerned, a perfect storm waiting to happen for Matthew Schultz and the Alouettes. It's just a matter of just going out, taking it one game at a time, and just work your plan. Simple as that. Exactly. Do the things that you did to be successful, and build on that. Exactly. It, just show up this week, people. If you can, just show up. Don't worry about it. Bug, uh, you know, bundle up. Come on out. Look, even even the owner Gary Stern goes on Twitter, and he's basically telling people, "Listen, we got a great football team here. We got guys that know how to play. We got some dogs on this team that are they're balling out. Come support the team." Mm-hmm. And and I got I got to agree with him. I said, "People, it's Montreal." Playoffs are just around the corner. Yep. You've got a good football team here. I'll, I'll even go so far as to say a very good football team. But you got to come out and support them. you got to bring the noise. you got to bring that fire, that energy. Yeah, it's going to be a little chilly. So what? Bundle up. Put a toque on. <laughs> it's not hard. Exactly. And guess what? You don't, if you don't have an Alouette jacket or a toque or sweater or what have you, I know a bunch of people that will be happy to sell you one on game day. <laughs> Problem or, solved. Yeah. Get yeah. your ass to the stadium. Yeah. 
or or hey, it may not be this week. Get us to a hundred people, a hundred people on uh, on YouTube, and uh, you may be getting one of the, getting a very nice prize. Well, there you go. Like, I mean, like, comment, subscribe. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. <laughs> exactly. Especially subscribe. Like I said, once we hit a hundred people on YouTube, oh, we've got a sweet treat for you. Yeah, I'll tell you. Um. So w- w- with the um. With Montreal having a new pro franchise being announced this week, uh, the uh, the Montreal Alliance, um, does that mean we're, we're starting another podcast? I guess we'll have to see, wouldn't we? <laughs> I mean, I, I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, spreading your wings and, uh, you know, trying to uh, trying out some new things. So uh, this may be something to consider. I mean, listen, we're all about the love here in Montreal. We, you know, we want to support Montreal. We want to make sure that the people realize this is a sports city. Mm-hmm. It's not just hockey. It's not just football. It's not just soccer. You know, maybe one day it'll be about baseball again. But uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But exactly. yeah, a new franchise here in Montreal. A new basketball franchise. Hey, that's exciting stuff, folks. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we hope to see you guys at the game. But if not, we will. We will be make sure that we are in your ear holes next week uh, to talk about the, what happened with the riders and uh, the lead up to the big, big, big back to back home and home series versus the league leading Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So, Cliffy, I will see you in the stands, and again, I hope to see you there too. So, for everybody here, at yes, the, sir. Yeah, for everybody here at the Owls Flight Deck, for Cliffy D, I'm Tim Capper. We're on final approach. <laughs>